Uh, hey, Alan. Hello. You're back. Yeah, for right now, until I have to take off here shortly, I have to go deal with some taxes. Oh, well, better you than me. Right? <laughs> I just got to go pick it all up from our people. Got you. Hey, guys, so we're going to get started in half a second here. And um, well, good to see you, Bob. Good to see you, Glenn. Good to see you, Blaine. Hey, sir. From sunny uh, Canada. How is it in the uh, Niagara Falls area today? It's cold, thanks to the Grand Solar Minimum, right? Have you heard about it? What is that? It's cold, and that's thanks to the Grand Solar Minimum. What is that? That's this concept that the solar waves are affecting planetary weather. It's actually bang on. There's a couple of places on YouTube that are following it. It's pretty cool. Oh, okay. you'll, have to, you'll have to catch me up on that when it's uh, uh, more on topic here. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, not to make you jealous, but we have like 65 degrees of sunny. On, on top of the mountain at uh, Evergreen, Colorado. But uh, anyway, we should have Master Smith join us in half a second. Welcome, uh, welcome Bob. And uh, we, we will uh, uh, try to get a, a quick start here for everybody. And uh, uh, Blaine, make sure you're clear. This is not um, actually uh, designed to be a member um, uh, session here. Uh, yours will be tomorrow, but you're very welcome to join us here. Uh, hopefully, so there's some valuable takeaway. Uh, from today as well, um, and um, um, but anyway, Master Smith, let's get going here. And I, uh, I think I'm in charge of all the controls, so I'm going to uh, mute out some of the other people who may have some background noise, if I can accomplish that. And everybody, you should have controls on your screen to mute and unmute. This is going to be completely interactive, and uh, this was a little last minute, so I'm not sure how many. Uh, how many people will join us, but we'll make it as productive as we can for everybody who does, and hopefully it will uh, will be worthwhile for you. But um, uh, Master Smith, let's start with this, is this was designed for everybody who hopefully has had plenty of time now to go through that uh, complete fill your school program. And I know what happens is, uh, you and I both have a tendency to load people up with so much material that it gets to be uh, perhaps a little confusing. But um, uh, what I would uh, really like to do is maybe just start uh, for everybody with a way to think about this as a uh, in in general terms uh, about how to think in in terms of your marketing because I think a lot of times um, school owners may not have a great structure for it. And, and then, Matt Smith, we can move on from there on just kind of the A to Zs of, uh, of what anybody is struggling with, answer any questions, and uh, uh, give them a little overview for what's, uh, what's happening with uh, uh, some school owners like Alan, who's here by phone, and, and so forth. Does that sound good, Master Smith? Certainly. Um, so maybe, Matt Smith, let's, let's start with this. Is You know, from a marketing perspective, I want to uh, – uh, talk about a couple of big picture items. One is we spend a lot of time talking about the marketing Parthenon. And what I find happens to us a lot is, you know, folks approach us because we're the marketing gurus. And what happens is they all want the magic pill. And I've got to tell you, I mean, we've been more successful at flooding people with a huge amount of traffic on intros than anybody I know. But it's never because of one magic pill. It's because of a whole bunch of stuff, some of which can be, a, you know, a grand slam home run. Others might be, uh, you know, regularly successful, but not just a, a, a huge home run. Some that are consistent every month with two or three enrollments and others that have the potential for 50 enrollments in a week. And so mistake number one in marketing is fixating on What's the one magic pill? How do I get all of my uh, students from online? How do I get all of my students from referrals? How do I get right? Any, any of those things to me is a mistake. You want to have uh, 
of the Parthenon. Think of the Greek Parthenon where you have a ton of different pillars, all of which are driving people into your school. Some of those are going to be platforms like Facebook. And I want to talk about that since they're in the news and I've been trying to keep up with Zuckerberg getting hammered by uh, the Congress and the Senate. But, uh, you know, some of them are Facebook or Google. Others are internal referrals. Others are external publicity. And I mean, real media like newspaper, TV, radio. Others uh, in that Parthenon are things like community outreach. If you're in the uh, business of working with uh, adults predominantly, sometimes that's social organizations, sports leagues, uh, companies and organizations. If you're in the kids market, that might be working directly with elementary schools. I've done, I don't know, what would you say, Master Smith? Probably 10,000 enrollments over the years directly from working in elementary, middle, and sometimes high schools. Um, but it can be community outreach in elementary schools, middle schools. It can be live events. It can be local community events. It can be um, uh, Alan, who's on our meeting here, uh, did a big event with Walmart last week. It can be Domino's, Pizza Hut. I mean, there's a, a whole variety. But if you start with one overarching premise, is if you try to rely on just one media process or event as your driving force for enrollments, that's guaranteed for failure. Because no matter how good any one thing is, there are going to be times that it doesn't work. Uh, in my case here in Denver with uh, Mile High Karate, I've had years where I was spending $150,000, $200,000 a year in the, the major daily newspapers. Rocky Mountain News, which doesn't exist anymore. Denver Post, which may not exist for much longer. Um, if I was trying to continue to replicate that, it probably wouldn't be, uh, it might work a little bit, it wouldn't work the way it did. For many years, I was driving a ton of traffic through infomercials, you know, full 30 minute TV shows. That doesn't work very well anymore. Um, I've had times when we were driving a bunch of traffic, uh, uh, this is an old example now, but we were driving a ton of traffic through uh, elementary school programs and then in Littleton, Colorado, Denver, Colorado, uh, Columbine hit and all the schools shut us out for over a year and a half. So you've got to never be dependent upon one thing. And even if that one thing is referrals, uh, re what, what happens with small broke schools that we talk to is they will all tell us that, oh, all, all my students come from word of mouth. And then my first question is, oh, well, what referral systems do you have that you're working to create referrals? And usually the answer, you know, after three paragraphs is none. Uh, maybe at most they give them all guest passes and tell them to bring their friends down. Well, that's not a system for generating referrals. And anybody can get two or three or four, five people a month in uh, through just kind of sitting there, opening your doors, putting a sign on the building and hoping that your uh, students bring some friends. But if you really want to have a big and successful school, you've got to build that Parthenon and have a lot of different uh, events going on. Matt Smith, what would you add to that? Well, I'd like to keep it in uh, terms that everybody understands. And uh, when we're talking about a Parthenon, I, I really like to divide it into two sections. I like to talk about internal marketing and I like to talk about external marketing. And then I like to divide our marketing into high cost, low labor, or high labor, low cost. So those are kind of the four that you're dividing into to find out where you have to seek out to get this Parthenon that you're referring to. Yeah. And, uh, you know, internal marketing, there's a lot of things that, that we that uh, the schools are doing. And, you know, a lot of times, some of the things we're doing that are working so well, I hear people say that uh, it's not working. And uh, we tweak it, we find out why they're, you know, what they're doing differently. So the, uh, the marketing things that we have done, both internal and external, both high cost and both uh, low cost, uh, have all worked well because we've worked all the bugs out of it. We we have the the most uh, recent working system or 
you know, the, the most recent uh, uh, evaluation of, of how that should be run properly because uh, some of the ways they were done in the past, uh, as you know, Master Oliver, uh, people used to do demonstrations and do live events and, uh, you know, get thousands of people to watch them and then get nobody to sign up. And then, you know, we found out that uh, learning how to uh, collect their lead information and how to make appointments. So there's, there's so many things that go into all this marketing but the first step is I have to make sure that I have my, what you call Parthenon, those, those different uh, levels of marketing all in place. And then the second thing is I have to make sure that I can afford that type of marketing. And, and the thing is, everybody can afford low cost, high labor. You know, I mean, nothing's for free. So you got to at least spend a little money or you got to at least spend some labor. So you decide what works best for you, whether you have more time or you have more money to invest in your marketing, and then make sure that you're doing them properly to generate through keeping proper statistics on all of these events, which ones are working the best. And if they aren't working, why aren't they working? And that's the advantage that we have is we can take somebody that a marketing piece is not working for them, whether it's a written marketing piece or a live piece, and find out in the system, going from that first contact with the individual all the way to the enrollment to see where they're getting lost in the process. Does that make sense? You're on mute there, Master Oliver. Okay, I mean, I didn't unmuted myself. There you go. Okay, so yeah, and that brings me to the next kind of overview of of marketing premise, Master Smith, and it, it it's a it's a right on track. Is what happens today is I think a lot of people think that you know if there's something where it costs me money and there's something that's free, I want to do the free thing, right? And that permeates the thinking across the board in a lot of unproductive ways. If I have a choice of, you know, and I, I always think in terms of it, of like mailing somebody something versus send an email, is people say, well, I, why do I need to mail anybody things anymore? I can just send them an email and emails for free. Well, one reason why that logic doesn't hold up is the average person in North America gets, the number I saw recently was 144 emails a day the average person gets three or four pieces of physical mail in their mailbox per day. So if I physically mail it to them, the odds of them actually seeing it are, you know, at least do that ratio, it's at least that much higher. The second element of it is, is if I communicate with them electronically versus I send them something physically, is the thing that I send them physically is something that they're able to, you know, put on a mag, you know, uh, put on the refrigerator with a magnet, sit on their desk, sit on the kitchen table. It has more potential to like lay around and remind them to uh, to connect with you. From a marketing standpoint and activity standpoint is what what again, what happens is if you don't know what your lifetime value of a student, what your expected uh, revenue is from a student, you don't think properly about your marketing activities. What I know with schools that we're working with, when we do it right and they implement properly, they're gonna have each student that they enroll is going to, over the lifetime of their enrollment, contribute six or $7,000 on average to the school. And that averages out the ones who, who enroll and drop on three months and the ones who are there for four years. But through proper tuition structures, proper renewal structures, proper um, retention systems, keeping students for long term, what we know is they're gonna be worth, let's take a number, let's say $6,000. So if a student is worth $6,000, the question is how much can I afford to spend to get that person in the door? Now, if you don't know that number, I've seen I've seen schools that I work with, work with uh, Blaine, you were uh, on the fringe of being one of them, but I've seen schools I work with where they're charging, 
you know, when, when they come in, they're charging $85 a month and, you know, people are on average dropping down in four months. Well, if that's you, the average student's only worth three or $400. So the, the amount that you can spend for somebody who's going to be worth $300 is dramatically different than somebody who's going to be worth $6,000. So a couple of principles built in there is, know what the average expectation is, the average lifetime value of a student. A simple shorthand for that is, what did I gross last year? How many new students did I enroll? What's that number? Uh, divide the new students into the gross revenue, the cash revenue, and that tells you what the average new enrollment was worth. So the second element is, so, so if you don't know that number, you've got a problem. The second element is, once you have that number, figure out what the best ways are to market to them, figure out what the best places are, best places to spend their money. What, what happens in the, uh, uh, or happened in the martial arts industry is, you know, in the age of YouTube, Facebook, social media, all the other social media, there's been what I uh, not too charitably uh, describe as a bozo explosion of pretend consultants. And so, there are a jillion people out running around uh, shouting from the highest rooftop, uh, running ads in Facebook and forming groups and contributing in groups and all of the other stuff that they, you know, posting YouTube videos. But what I will tell you is, is you know, 99 out of 100 are, one is usually haven't ever been there, done that. If they have run a successful school, they haven't run it in a multi-school environment where it had to be systems not personality, right? So, and, and, and beyond that is most of them haven't gone beyond the energy they put into their school if they ever had a successful school and moved it into really understanding what made that business work, right? And one of the bozo explosion fallacies has been this free versus spending money in the proper place. There's you know, a ton of people are telling you all you need is email and all, 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 of, all marketing is now online. You shouldn't do offline stuff. All, all marketing is free. You don't have to pay for it. I got to tell you, with Google and with Facebook, there is no free lunch. Uh, you're, not, you're not getting much, not zero, but not much free traffic. And the free traffic you get from Google is because you spent money paying somebody or doing it yourself on search engine optimization, and that's not free either. Uh, so one... One bozo explosion element is this idea of everything should be free. Number two bozo explosion is the idea that email is all you need. Oh, well, just follow up with email. It'll be fine. Well, you might, if, if, you, if you miss everything else, get this. Email is dying a slow and painful death. And if you want to know the, the, the reality of it, all I need to do is look at my 16 year old daughter is the only reason she uses email is her high school uses email. And in that she uses her high school email address. Uh, the rest of the time she pays no attention. Email has really become just a corporate environment tool that in most cases, corporate software systems, there's a ton of different developmental projects. We use Basecamp, ton of de de developmental projects in place to get people completely off of email in the corporate environment because it's become unmanageable. So premise number one, that fifth was Parthenon. Premise number two was think about your marketing as really having four uh, categories, as you said, things that are low labor and inexpensive, which are harder to come by, but a lot of referral systems fit in that category. Things that are high labor, inexpensive, we have a ton of those type of things, whether it's the movie theater or external live events or elementary school, et cetera. There are things that are expensive and low labor. That tends to be more traditional advertising, whether it's direct mail or whether it's uh, buying ads on Facebook and so forth. Um, and then we have things that are expensive and high labor, which is probably not the ideal combination, but sometimes you'll do trade shows, expositions, different things, where it's pretty expensive, uh, plus it takes some effort. Uh, some of those things are gonna be such home runs that they're worth it. Others are probably, uh, it's the wrong combination. Uh, Matt Smith, before we go any further, let me uh, stop here 
And let me introduce, uh, first we have Bob Dunn on the line here. Bob, wave there. Hey guys. Uh, How you doing? Everybody who has a pen and piece of paper, Bob's phone number, the cell phone that he has stuck in his ear there, is uh, 720-256-0208. Uh, say, say that one more time, that was a little fast. Uh, 720-256-0208. And uh, uh, anybody on the, the meeting here today who doesn't have that complete fill your school program, Feel free to call Bob and uh, and chat with him about that. And Bob, we can go ahead and extend that New Year's offer if somebody uh, here doesn't have that. This was designed for people who do, but if somebody showed up that didn't, that'd be fine uh, with me, Bob. Uh, but okay. the second thing is, anybody who is, you know, uh, uh, two hundred thousand a year or greater, you probably should be working with us individually to to really accelerate your your net profit. And Master Smith would love to chat with you about that. Uh, so, uh, and, and by the way, for anybody, we have some free tools that you're welcome to take advantage of at martialartswealth.com. There's a, a free 90 minute video. There's uh, a free download of both of my, uh, or two of my, I've got more than that, but two of, of my martial arts marketing books. Uh, so anybody, you know, write that down. And if you don't have that information, go ahead and take advantage of it. Uh, I'll introduce, and Bob Dunn, by the way, has been working with martial arts schools for 15 years. Um, he knows more about what makes uh, martial arts schools run than uh, uh, 99 out of 100 of the Bozo Explosion uh, consultants out there who are shouting from the highest rooftop. I do find, Bob, in fact, Bob, give, let's get, have you, since you're on mic, give them your perspective. What are the three failure signals that you get from people you talk to right away since you talk to a lot more school owners than I do. Yeah, I, well, um, you know, it's interesting. So I, it, here's one of the biggest ones. I, I just got off uh, with a, another school owner this afternoon right before I hopped on here. And, um, you know, this is a commonality. So, I mean, we're talking a little bit and he's telling me about his school. He's telling me about how great the school is and how great his retention is. And I said, well, that's interesting. I said, how good is your retention? What is your stats right now? What are your numbers? And he said, well, to be honest, I don't have those numbers. And I explained to him, you know, I've come across a lot of people that, that don't have those numbers that uh, when they actually go back and take a look at them, they're not as great as they actually think they are. So uh, retention is always an issue. And then, of course, um, you know, the value in what you're delivering. Uh, that's one thing that's greatly undersold with all of the other schools. Yeah. And definitely understanding and learning how to do the different marketing. Well, and let, let's give everybody a benchmark is a, 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 a commonality, wouldn't you say, Bob, is that every martial arts instructor that we talk to, with few exceptions, say, is, no, my students love me. I have great retention. All I need, if you can teach me how to get another 10 new students a month, or if you can show me how to get another 100 students, everything's fine. Absolutely. Right? And the reality is our benchmark is we want to lose no more than one or two percent a month so in order to maintain 300 active that means you only need three to six enrollments a month to stay there and what happens is most schools and master smith you're you're pretty clear on this most schools are start the year at 150 enroll 150 or 200 people for the year in the year at 150 and so They've completely turned over the entire school for the year. But with, they, they have good retention because they still have classes that are fairly full from where, where they were at the beginning. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and if, if you extrapolate that number, that means they're losing 8 or 10% of their student body every month. Yeah. Right? And so what we mean by good retention is I'm losing 1.5% or 2% a month. So... Therefore, at the end of the year, 75 or 80 percent of everybody I enrolled is still there. And 75 or 80 percent of those people that I enrolled are renewed long term. So what um, um, well, you know, one of the great business coaches of all time, uh, business writers of all time, his name is Peter Drucker. And his line was what gets measured gets done. And what happens so many times is 
we use our emotional reaction to what's going on to determine whether the numbers are good or bad. But if we don't actually know what's happening is we don't know where to focus, right? And growing the school really is only two things. How many new people do you put in the door? How long do you keep them, right? And the revenue is how many new people come in the door, how long you keep them and what their uh, value is, right? Yeah. So, and Master Oliver, and, and real quick, uh, just one thing to add to that, that's a commonality, that everybody believes that their situation is unique, that their demographic is unique. And it's just not the case. We've been working with school owners for a, a long time, and the systems work with all the schools, no matter where they are. So yeah. just to pitch that in, throw that in. Well, well, right. I mean, everybody's excuse for their pricing is, you don't understand my people, and, 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 and I... It, I have close friends, uh, Ernie Reyes, uh, Sr. and Tony Thompson, and their excuse for their pricing in Silicon Valley is you don't understand that the uh, cost of living here is so high, nobody can afford anything more. Um, so I, I hear it. I'm in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas. I couldn't possibly. I'm in uh, Silicon Valley. I couldn't possibly. It is, is That's almost always an excuse for yourself. Um, and so now let me introduce Master Smith. Matt, we have uh, Grandmaster Jeff Smith here, 10th degree black belt. And uh, Master Smith, you have run million dollar plus annual martial arts school since what, early mid 70s, right? I mean, your, your martial arts career goes back to the early 60s. Uh, from a competitive standpoint, if anybody doesn't know, we have some inform interesting information, but you were the first world light heavyweight kickboxing champion you still have the most watched kickboxing match ever. I, I imagine you still beat out. Did Conor McGregor beat you? Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, we were worried, not that I consider him a martial artist, but uh, that's a story for a different day. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, you were on the Ollie Frazier undercard, 50 million viewers, won uh, Don King's heavyweight kickboxing title, uh, and immediately you retired Don King and Kareem Ala from uh, kickboxing. And, uh, but the more important for our purposes is in a very credible, high quality way, have been running multi-million dollar business operations in the martial arts business, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, uh, 2000, uh, well now, whatever the hell you call it, but for a long time, right? Yeah, the, the 2000 teens, whatever. Uh, and, uh. You know, in my background is I, uh, um, you know, came out of the Junior Institute as a branch manager while I was working my way through uh, uh, Georgetown University, came to Denver, Colorado, um, got a lot of press uh, when I opened here because I opened five schools in 18 months, six schools in 30 months. The, and by the way, this isn't a recommendation. I would do, I would have done it. <laughs> but, um, um, but I was at 1500 active students uh, within two years in a, uh, uh, I mean, I ran the numbers. It was a million dollar operation then, but that's the equivalent of a $3 million operation in today's uh, dollars if you account for inflation. Uh, in fact, uh, Grandmaster Smith, the Junior Institute, when you were running it and I came out of there, their average location was in uh, 1981, doing 30,000 gross a month that translates to 90,000 gross a month now. It's almost a three time multiple. I think it, it's a 2.7 multiple if you look at the inflation factor. So that was 13 schools, average revenue of in today's dollars of about a million a year. Yeah, and that, and that, that average of 30, that, that counts for the ones that were doing in the 50s and the ones that were doing in the low 20s. Yeah. You know, so, and that's usually what happens with multi-schools. You've got some that are doing a lot higher, and you got some that are doing lower. But you're going to get an average value there, yeah. and uh, that's why you got to be careful with uh, with opening too many schools too soon because uh, uh, it's harder to get all of them up to that higher gross than it is uh, to keep those uh, those first few. Yeah, and in my case, I got all of them up to really high grosses. The challenge was filling it with staff because I was having to fill it with external people rather than having time to have grown them internally. And there really wasn't a feeder like, uh, you know, like Greg Macy has a feeder because he has a bunch of old mile-high karate black belts he can draw from now here. Um, 
And, and for everybody's information, I mean, we, um, we are the place where we keep track of what's going on currently in the industry. Um, our little um, meeting today is interrupting my binge watching of Mark Zuckerberg being grilled by the uh, Congress, U.S. Congress today, the U.S. Senate yesterday, uh, which um, I, I watched a, mo a movie last night, Mass Smith, called Beirut, and there's a great line in there. It starts out with they're hosting a dinner party at the uh, embassy uh, in uh, Beirut. Uh, this is pre-Civil War. Um, and uh, the lead character says, nothing will make you question the, uh, our democracy more than spending a, an evening socializing with a room full of congressmen. Uh, and uh, so watching the hearing certainly anchors in the fact that uh, um, a whole bunch of them have no idea what they're talking about. Um, I, I, I hate to see them regulate that soon. But the, and by the way, let's address that for a second as an aside, is Facebook's in the news a lot right now. And we have had a, a fair number of schools having big results with Facebook. Uh, but even some of our advertising that we were doing on Facebook a couple of weeks ago has changed in the, uh, the light of all of this uh, Kerfuffle, kerfuffle about data in one thing or another, if that's the right word. Uh, the, the, the first reality of what's going on with all this stuff with Facebook is if anybody is surprised by the various revelations and the various news right now, it means you weren't paying attention to what Google and Facebook's business model has been from day one. Because really all they are are big advertising conglomerates that their number one asset is they know more about you than anybody else. So then they can sell to an advertiser groups of people by interest, geography, demographic, income. So they can let advertisers target people in an income range who are homeowners, who lean right, who lean left, who, have, who are issue oriented. They can target moms who have kids with ADD or ADHD because they know that from what you're clicking on, paying attention to. They're reading your messages and they're indexing that. And I'm talking about Google and Facebook, by the way. Uh, Google is tracking your email. Google, if you use Gmail at least, Google is tracking everything you click on. They're tracking the videos you own in their property, YouTube. They know what, which ones you watch a long time, which ones you watch a short time. They know which ads you click on so they can show you more of those. They know which ads you ignore so you can, they can take those away. As a consumer, it's a benefit. And this all goes back to uh, Seth Godin wrote a great book years ago called Permission Marketing. But the primary idea of it was in what he termed interruption marketing. I'm watching my favorite TV show and a TV spot comes on. I'm listening to my favorite radio song or talk or whatever and an ad comes on. Is anytime I interrupt somebody to show them a commercial message, I'm looking at my kids' dog pictures and you know what they're eating in their baby pictures or whatever, and all of a sudden I see an ad. The premise was anytime I interrupt somebody, the more I can have it relative to them. Uh, an idea that goes even further back, John E. Kennedy, a great copywriter, he is saying was all advertising should get inside the conversation already going on in their head. The difference between broadcast media like TV and Google and Facebook is they know the conversation intimately going on in your head because they're tracking everything you do. So anybody who's surprised just hasn't been paying attention. Um, I'm not sure why it's such a, uh, a controversy now. Uh, all the same things that happened in our last presidential election happened in the uh, uh, presidential election of Barack Obama. There was great glowing uh, articles in Wired Magazine and all the different tech magazines about how effectively and thoroughly uh, the Obama campaign had exploited uh, uh, and data mined uh, uh, Facebook. And then the same thing with the Trump administration. So there's nothing that should be a shock. It's just that most human beings don't pay much attention. As marketers, we pay a lot of attention to that. And, and, but the, the other thing about all these hearings is 
the recognition that the only thing that's constant is change, right? They may well come out of these hearings and the U.S. Congress and, you know, um, uh, nationally or the different provinces in Canada and elsewhere, I know UK is talking about this as well. They may all of a sudden have all these laws uh, directed at Facebook that make them an ineffective advertising platform. Um, you know, I don't, I don't trust put 500 lawyers in the room and have them come up with anything that makes, makes any sense. And, you know, what, what has happened, again, when I say the only thing constant has changed is U.S. and Canada are a little different, and mostly Canada is a little bit more wild, wild west than U.S., but, you know, Canada has problems with getting a good mail list because of their privacy laws with regards to children. Uh, in the U.S., uh, our Congress has basically outlawed outbound telemarketing. They've essentially outlawed um, uh, outbound robocalls except for themselves. Uh, so, that, you know, they outlawed fax broadcast marketing. They regulated email marketing, although it's, they're still not. Uh, in fact, Canada just passed some laws that made email a lot harder uh, than it is in the U.S. now where there weren't any regulations uh, before. So what 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 we're really focused on with our members is staying on top of what's working now because we know the only constant is change. And, you know, if Master Smith and I were teaching you what we knew worked really well 15 years ago, well, that would be, that would be a disaster. We'd be the bozos then. We'd have to put a, a dunce cap on because some of that stuff works great still. Some of that stuff is, uh, is into the dustbin. Um, you know, I can't do page three in the TV guide every weekend anymore because the main paper that I liked went out of business and the second paper doesn't have a TV guide anymore. It's all, it's all digital. Um, I have a hard time running infomercials because everybody does deep, myself included. I never, other than just kind of letting the news run in the background a lot of days, I, I don't watch any TV show when it is on. Everything is DVR, so I'm not channel surfing ever. Um, no pages. Say it again. No yellow pages anymore. Well, yeah, and, and that's maybe a little different because all all that happened with the yellow pages is it, is it became Google, right? So to a, the the way to think about what Google is is it's just a new version of the yellow pages with some enhancements, right? Most of the enhancements about uh, Google becoming the yellow pages is that they can then follow you everywhere you go. So whether you consider it spooky or useful is up to you, but the whole retargeting thing, I mean, Google controls so many different properties. Um, it's one of the things we teach is retargeting in Facebook and retargeting in Google. Once somebody shows interest, you can kind of like haunt them everywhere they go. It's, if you don't believe me, go, uh, you know, go to Auto Trader or something and look at a car. Uh, you know, now, Master Smith, after you and I were looking at those cars, every Ferrari, Ferrari and Bentley, on the market shows up in my, uh, uh, every time I do a Google search and every time I do a uh, look at Facebook, I'm getting black Ferraris and red Ferraris and black Bentleys and silver Bentleys and all, all, all of that all the time. Plus I'm on all the watch sites. So I'm getting every new uh, uh, Rolex and AP and um, uh, everything that shows up. So one, you have to know how to use that stuff, but two, you have to realize that the only thing that's constant has changed is we may be in the heyday of Facebook and then they get regulated and it's not nearly as productive anymore. At the very least, regulation is gonna tamp down some of the value that we're, um, that we're benefiting from it. So we've gotta stay on top of that. Uh, let, Master, let's open it up for questions. Uh, uh, Glenn, Derek, Ty, Bernard, uh, uh, anybody else online, Jeff? Any, any questions about anything we've talked about today or, or anything else for that matter? Master Oliver, I think it's fair to uh, just to point out, we have some new people in the room that and this isn't style specific and any of the marketing works for any style out there, whether you're targeting children or adults. So it's uh, friendly in that way. Just wanted to make sure everybody was clear. Well, yeah, and that, that's again, the my thing is different deal, right? Is, you know, we talk to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu schools who think that what they're doing is different MMA schools who think what they're doing is different. We talk to people in small towns, big cities, and certainly there are some nuances, 
the way you're going to structure the class format for your Brazilian Jiu Jitsu class versus a Muay Thai class versus a, a Taekwondo class. But the marketing principles are the same. And, you know, if I say we were very successful in elementary schools, well, that's obviously for elementary age kids. But the same principle applies for adults. I just have to know where to find them. So um, uh, one of our members, Elite MMA in Houston, uh, we've been working very successfully, and they go to uh, uh, British, you know, and they're in Houston, a lot of oil companies. So they can go to uh, uh, Exxon Mobil, they can go to uh, BP, all the big oil company headquarters, work with the HR departments, go do things with, with those big oil companies. And, you know, I've done a lot of that stuff as well, worked with uh, Coors, worked with uh, uh, U.S. West, which is now CenturyLink, so, um, and worked with the Denver Broncos and the uh, the Denver Nuggets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, if some of this stuff you just have to know that if there's a concept that works in an elementary school, that same concept works to get adults. It's just in a different arena. I can I can go, you know, work with Boy Scouts to get kids, but I can also work with Kiwanis JCs. I can work with uh, women's clubs. I can work with uh, local athletic clubs, I can work with local golf clubs. I mean, there's all kinds of different groups where the same adults that I'm interested hang out. Uh, well, good. I have a Anybody? question. Go ahead. I have a question. Uh, un don't forget to unmute yourself too. That's right. You should be able to just click the little microphone on your screen and then you're unmuted. Uh, but uh, anything at all, feel free to chip in. We, uh, 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 whether it's on topic or a little off topic, it's fine. I see a couple familiar names. Hi, uh, hi. I have a question. This is Derek. Okay, go ahead, Derek. Hi, thanks very much. Um, what's the trick to getting, um, you know, it's one of the internal marketing events, like a movie night or a pizza night, uh, when people invite their friends, how, like the best follow-up uh, procedure um, and getting, I guess, um, tricks in getting um, information from visitors. So they're not just coming in and watching a movie or eating pizza and then leaving. And that same question for, uh, if you do like a guest gym, um, you know, karate for concentration, your, your guest uh, gym teacher, um, you have a bunch of kids. I've had, I've done that before in the past and I've passed out flyers and then you never get any, any follow-ups. Um, I don't have any information from the kids. I just give them out. Uh, well, let's, so let's, let's yeah, Derek, let's address that and then feel free to follow up. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. The first thing, well, no, and, and, and so just keep asking, you know, questions to follow up if I'm not right on target for you. But the first thing is you always want you to have the ability to follow up proactively rather than kind of metaphorically sit by the phone, hoping they'll call. Right. And so in all cases, what that means is you want to, if it all, at all possible, never to just be doing entertainment, passing out literature, hoping for the best, okay? That's true whether it's an internal event, an elementary school, center court at the shopping mall or center court at, uh, or I guess on the field on a, on a football game, whatever the, the event and the audience is. So that's one premise. The other premise is talking demos and performances. Whenever possible, you want everybody taking a class from you as opposed to seeing you perform, right? You want to move them from spectator to participant. So I would rather, you know, let, let's say I have the elementary school you used as, a, as an example. I would rather have I go in and do PE teacher for the day, and I have uh, 20 groups of 30 kids, than to go into the auditorium and talk to all of them at once, right? So what I want to be able to do is teach them rather than just entertain them wherever possible. Now, the third thing is, is I want to have a good mechanism for getting name, address, and phone number that's that proactively following up, right? You mentioned a couple of very specific examples, so I'll give you very specific answers for those. With, um, 
with my idea of um, Ash Smith, I, uh, as you remember, I started doing this in 1984, is I would go out into elementary school, middle school, high school, teach PE teacher for the day, and end up with just tons of enrollments from it. That idea got butchered, uh, again, a bozo explosion phenomenon, and got packaged by somebody else as school talks. The problem with what they packaged and did is they missed the one key component that made it work. And what they said was what you just did, said. I went and I do a school talk for Mrs. Jones class of 30 kids or the entire school or whatever, but mostly what they were teaching is going to Mrs. Jones's class and talk to 30 kids. Then I give them a flyer and say, hey, by the way, we're gonna do a class, special class for all of you guys on Saturday morning, come on down. Well, it's not that that doesn't work, Derek, as you know, it just doesn't work very well, right? You get minuscule response to the point that you're frustrated and pissed off that you cho chewed up that much time. Is that a fair way to say it, Derek? Oh, I spent a whole afternoon. And it's exhausting. <laughs> exhausting. Yeah. Well, what you're, what you're doing is you're implementing my idea without the one thing that makes it work. And here's the one thing that makes it work. Permission slips. So. Oh, yeah. I, I pass out permission slips ahead of time. The PE teacher and the uh, school are used to this because I have a nine-year-old. They, they're going to a museum trip, which they're doing uh, next week or anything else. They put in the Friday folder. They send a slip home to the parents. The parents have to sign off on it. My daughter is getting stuff like this all the time from high school. Parents are used to that. It's no big deal. Now, what happens is is when, uh, when I talk to school owners about this, Canada, US, wherever, what they say is, well, schools won't give me the kids' contact information because they can't share that by law. Well, that's a true statement, but that's not what you're asking for. The parents can share anything they want, right? So the school can't say by law, US or Canada in most places, they can't say, here's our roster of all the kids, here's their age, here's the address, here's the phone number, here's the parents' names, have it. They can't do that. But what they can do is pass out registration forms that parents voluntarily turn in. They do that all the time for before school programs, after school programs, enrichment programs. They can pass out permission slips. They can give the information the parents uh, give you, I mean, give them to you, right? There's no limitation to that at all. There's no legal limitation. There's more, more, no moral ethical limitation. And the parents are well within their rights not to fill it out. What we find is if I go into an elementary school of 400 kids, we'll get 800 permission slips back. Those permission slips will say, everybody who participated today at Leewood Elementary uh, will receive a, a free month of lessons and a free uniform, uh, $250 value. If you'd like to be contacted to uh, take advantage of that, check yes. Well, now I've got 400 people who turned back permission slips, 200 that gave me permission to contact them. Now, Derek, that's a hell of a lot different than you passed out flyers and, and two people three weeks later called you, right? I uh, got no calls. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, so I, so I'm being generous to uh, the ripoff of my idea, right? Oh, the, that's great. Now, the the other question you asked was movie night, or let's broaden it out and say it's a birthday party. We have a system uh, that we call the ultimate referral machine. Uh, Blaine, you're a member. You have access to all that stuff. But it's basically do a pizza part. Uh, basically do a birthday party without being the excuse as their birthday. But with all of those things, Derek, if it's at all possible, so if it's an event where the parents are gonna bring their kids, what you want to do is get contact information ahead of time. So if possible, you get them to give you a list of who they'd like to invite and you send out invitations. Now in some of the events that's impractical. So. I'm gonna do a big board breaking night, a ninja night, a movie night, you know, whatever the excuse, women's self-defense, and you're gonna have 70 students or 20 students bring an average of 1.5 friends each. 
it's difficult to do that, right? What we do instead is on the way in the door, like literally table across the door, you don't get past me until you do this, is on the way in the door, they fill out the information sheet waiver, just like uh, any other student would do uh, to try an intro. Because you've got to know who was in your school, who took a class. If it's a child, you got to know parents' names and have permission, all that stuff. Would you agree? And the so, waiver is the key. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a participation event, so you do need a waiver. Yeah. So, yeah. but you block the door. And, and by the way, don't put a volunteer 16-year-old doing this. Although we have some great 16-year-olds who are well-trained and competent. But don't put some volunteer at the door and say, hey, have them fill this out. You know, if it were me, the most competent person in the school would be at the door. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to have them all fill that out on the way in. And on the way in, I'm going to say, uh, now, Mrs. Jones, uh, I'm sure Billy's going to have a great time tonight. All the kids who are coming down with, with students for the movie night are all also receiving a free follow-up lesson. And most of the kids are going to come back in on Monday night. Some of them prefer Tuesday because they have other conflicts or activities. Which of those times would work better for your schedule? Now, notice what I'm doing is I'm getting the information, scheduling the appointment before they walk in the door. I'm not doing this because this doesn't work. I'm not running the thing, maybe teaching an exciting class, watching Karate Kid, whatever, and then saying, hey, who had fun? Great. If you had fun and want to come back for another class, come over to the desk and sign up because guess what? Nobody does. Right? And it's not that they're not interested. What happens in the parents' minds and in the kids' minds is they say, give me the information. Really hectic. I don't want to wait around uh, for you guys. I'll call back and do that. But Derek, how many of them call back? Uh, well, I'm still say it again. Uh, I'm still waiting for a call. Exactly. Yeah, but and and now what happens is we we have a little system that we recommend that we'll text them a bunch of times, like four times, email them a bunch of times, and we'll typically send a a, a reminder postcard to get them to show up to the appointment, but. What our standard stat would be, and Matt Smith, correct me if you think this is off, but if I have 50 people show up, we'll get like 45 of them make appointments, and we'll get 30 or more of them show up for the intro, and at least half enroll. Does that sound about right, Master Smith? Yeah, it's it's at least a 50, 40, 30. Kind of kind of goes down a little bit each one. Yeah, but almost 100% will make appointments on the way in the door. Um, uh, and, but, and, and then on follow-up again, you know, not to be unkind, but the Bozo explosion will say, oh, put them in an email sequence. And if they're interested, they'll call you. Well, you put them in an email sequence and if they're interested in most cases, uh, they're never even going to see the email. Right. Um, uh, again, you've got spam filters. You know, I, I mean, in my case, I've got an autoresponder on my email that has me pulling out my hair says I don't use email anymore. Uh, go away, right? But in, in the general public is not quite that bad. You know, mom of a nine-year-old is kind of paying attention to what's coming in from, you know, from the elementary school. Jeff, you know the, the deal. Jody's all the time saying to me, did you get, did you read the email from uh, uh, Chase's school? Well, I'm trying to pay attention, but I've got, you know, thousand emails this week I haven't read. Um, so, you know, usually the answer is, oh, they sent an email, let me go search for it, and I'll read it. Oh, you didn't read it. No, I didn't even know I got it, right? Uh, so what you want to do always, Derek, is make the, get the information and make the appointment on the spot. Then when you're following up electronically, well, the most productive thing still is you pick up the phone and call them. What we know in the era of cell phones is people don't answer their phone. So our rule of thumb is you call them you leave a voicemail, then you text them. And text messaging is what email was 10 years ago, right? 
there's that old movie you remember, Master Smith, You've Got Mail, is, you know, at one time, you know, I mean, the whole movie was the guy sitting at his computer waiting for his little, you know, mailbox to click, right? Is, um, you know, still text messaging has nearly 100% open rate and a pretty high response rate. So you want to always do an outbound call, text them, or leave a voicemail and text them. But then you want to follow up by call, direct mail, text, email, Facebook and Google retargeting. Once you have an email address or a phone number, you can load the list up into, into Facebook and they can see be seeing ads forever. You can load the list up into uh, Google and they can see seen as so you can retarget based upon physical email address or, or phone number. Uh, the other thing, Derek, is a, is a last deal. Most of the fix is getting it up front. But as a last thing to say is almost everyone gives up on, on prospects too quickly. And I especially think of it this way. If, if I was sending you direct mail and you were collecting the postcard, and then you sat down, made a family decision, and called me. Well, the odds of you enrolling right now are probably 70, 80%, right? But you come into an event that the only thing that uh, uh, was a commonality is we put it on a date that we wanted it to be, and you got drugged down for, for a friend. Uh, an awful lot of them that don't enroll, it's not that they don't enroll because they're not interested. It's that they're getting ready to go to grandma's for the spring break, or they just enrolled in soccer and hockey, or um, um, you know somebody's in the hospital or whatever. There's other things in their life that it wasn't the right time to start uh, a, new, a new program. So if I have a good prospect in April, I better follow up with them in May and June because they might be looking to start a program in the summer. And by the way, they're not gonna remember about us by then, right? Or I better follow up in August because they may be looking for something for the fall. So I want to keep going back to them and keep going back to them and keep going back to them. And again, if you know your lifetime value, if a new enrollment's worth $6,000, can I afford to send them a jillion emails, periodic text messages, uh, periodically with a good excuse call them, send them two or three pieces of mail them, a month. Well, I can afford to do all that stuff, and I will get a much better response rate uh, over a period by doing that. Does that help, Derek? Yes, that was excellent. Thank you very. That was very thorough. I appreciate it very much. You're very welcome. Yeah. Do you have a, a follow-up question? Uh, how much? No, got, I, I, that was. We got about fifteen other black belts on the line, and they, they're they're all very shy. <laughs> Thorough. That was a very thorough answer. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, but uh, the reaction I get sometimes is uh, I just didn't want to know that much about it. <laughs> right? No, I'm taking notes, so no, it's much more than I expected. Great, great. Let, let me remind everybody of Bob Dunn's phone number, 720-256-0208. If you don't have that program or have any questions about the program, or if you're a couple hundred thousand above and we should be talking about working together more uh, effectively, give him a call and we can schedule an appointment. Uh, that website was martialartswealth.com. Uh, you'll get free books, completely free, digital downloads. You'll get, uh, uh, what is it, Master Smith? About three and a half hours of recorded online seminar material. So um, um, I would uh, remind you of that if you don't have that information. But Matt Smith, why don't we uh, give it one or two more questions if we can round a couple up and then we'll call it a day. Okay. Anybody have any other questions? Make sure you unmute yourself because we got everybody muted. Sir, if anyone, I don't want to hog the time, but if there's no other questions. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned something about uh, an incentive for a free month or uh, for those who want to, or interested. Um, do you often uh, do free versus paid trials um, in general? Uh, just, just a general question on free versus paid trials for uh, intros and things it, like that. It's a good it's a question. question. 
It's a good question. Yeah, it's a, re it's a really good question. And um, it is kind of one of those bozo explosion things where people end up with this religious fervor about one thing or another that isn't necessarily um, um, tested out. Is Derek, the first thing is, if you have a option to get the same number of people where you can get them to give you money up front versus they're gonna come in for free. Getting money up front certainly does improve the show rate and make them a little bit more solid. Uh, the other consideration though is a short period of time versus a longer period of time. If I had my choice between a paid intro that's two months or 16, 20 lessons, or a paid intro that's, or a free intro that's two lessons. Every day of the week, I would take the free intro for two lessons. The reason for that is the longer the intro period that they uh, came in for, the more that's gonna get in the way of enrolling them right away. And if they don't enroll right away, most of the time they're not going to one way or the other, okay? So in our case, if I was doing the movie night situation, I'm going to uh, almost all cases do it as a free intro because it's going to be, again, depending upon the situation, birthday party, pizza party, movie night, but incorporated into the script is gonna be the event that Billy brought Joey down to really is today, plus it's an additional free lesson when it's not quite as crazy. Uh, we're gonna schedule that for Monday or Tuesday. And that logic doesn't lend itself as much to, why don't you pay me $49 today? Does that make sense? Yep. But, but we also know that I can do Groupon type of offers, uh, uh, charitable fundraiser type of offers. Uh, we've done stuff with uh, here Children's Hospital or with St. Jude's where Domino's and Pizza Hut and local grocery stores and uh, McDonald's will pass stuff out for us as a fundraiser. And that's usually a paid offer because the logic is what they pay for the offer is going to go to the charity and then we're going to provide the lessons, right? So in general, I default to free, but if I can find an environment where it's either more appropriate to charge or I can get their same response rate by charging, then I'd prefer to have a short paid intro as opposed to a longer paid intro. And I'd rather have a paid intro than a free intro. Does, does that make sense? I, 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 we, we could talk about this for another 45 minutes, but that was the short. Let me, let me, yes, add, sir. There. Let me add something in there, Mr. Oliver. Uh, uh, Derek, like when you're doing a, that movie night, uh, you know, never do a movie night or anything like that at the school uh, without teaching a class. You know, okay. give a good, fun uh, intro class as part of the event. Uh, that way, you're going to get them excited about the program. Well, if they're excited about the program and then they can get something free and maybe a uniform on top of it, you know, it might cost you 10 to 20 bucks for the uniform but it only takes one enrollment out of everybody would cover those uh, uniform prices for the rest of the year. Yeah. So the idea is that get them excited. Once you get them excited and then you give them a free offer and the incentive that Master Oliver was talking about before was like, when you come in, you're going to get a uniform. Well, now the kid's excited about getting an official karate uniform and uh, is going to be more likely to come. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. When you have a, a something free, you're going to have a lot more participation. Now, like Master Oliver saying, was if it was a charity thing, then they would expect to pay something because that's going to charity. So we've done quite a few of those. But if we're at a live event and uh, and we're giving them incentive to come in by spinning a wheel and winning a prize, well, they're going to come to the school to get that prize. And we'll make an appointment for that lesson there on the spot. You follow me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, I mean, we've, we've hit a lot of topics, uh, but, you know, I, I keep hearing, again, bad advice of, 
like sometimes we 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 do a lot of, of real productive marketing with movie theaters. And I heard a close friend who's a high profile uh, coach in the industry, but he said, "Oh, that doesn't work. It's too hard to get into the theater, and you just spend a bunch of time." Well, you know, we've had Blaine. You've seen a bunch of the success stories. I don't know if you've had any yet yourself, but we've had people who, uh, you know, like with a Black Panther movie. Uh, got a hundred what 150 leads 120 appointments uh 60 intros and 30 enrollments uh from that uh so you know there is a lot of bad advice a lot of times what's missing is people will understand kind of the big picture of what it is we're doing and then try to reteach it or try to go do it without understanding the tactics and then miss the uh, point you know like with the movie theater thing specifically they think it's difficult to get in. Well, it's super simple, easy, slam dunk to get in in 85% of the screens in the United States. So, you know, there's just a, an awful lot of bad advice that goes on. Glenn, did uh, you have a question? Yes. Here, oh, can you oh, hear me? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead Glenn. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Glenn Spence, I'm, I'm new here. I'm, I'm multitasking, <laughs> uh, yeah. but I appreciate the You look the, pretty busy. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. I am, but it's okay. Uh, but this is... This is important. I, I, I've been getting your, your, your trickle, uh, what do you call it? I guess they call it drip, drip, drip uh, emails and reminders. And I keep saying, a buddy of mine named Jeff Cielo has, yeah. has known you for years. And he said, you got to listen to this guy. I said, I know, I need to, I need to. And I want to, first of all, thank you for, for that system that you've got. But uh, I just did a, a thing on the news where they actually called me in because of Black Panther and because I do ablated art, and and I'm black, <laughs> so it <laughs> I came, I, hey whatever works, but it gives me a thing. So it, it's it's on WTKR channel three down here in Virginia, um, and it got a lot of oh my Facebook thing got blowed up. I had a hundred and something likes, and and I've had over six hundred and something hits on my website, but only got about three, you know, people that I'm got for appointments right now. Yeah. Um, and I really need to probably. Uh, just kind of get on board with you guys and uh, I, I need to be mentored in the, in the business aspect. I'm a 30 year army veteran been doing martial arts all my life, but I've just been, my soul's been open now for three years and I'm hovering between, you know, 50, I sit in 50 and about 65 students. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I yeah, so that's kind of where I am. What, and what's your, uh, what's your military? I, I need to, I need, I need to, What's your military background? Uh, U.S. Army. Uh, started off infantry. Uh, I started off infantry uh, in the Army, airborne. Uh, then I went transportation logistics with me for like three years and then went warrant officer. And then uh, a lot of people don't know it, but the Army has ships. So I sailed. Uh, I, I got my unlimited tonnage captain's license and sailed ships all over the world for the U.S. Army. Wow. Wow. Yeah, pretty much it. Well, thank you for your service. Uh, as you all know, Jeff is a uh, an app. I got that right. An app, uh, Annapolis graduate, um, and uh, one of our um, uh, behind the scenes meetings is going to be in, uh, at Army. We're going to be at West Point in uh, in August. And um, wow, uh, awesome. The uh, uh, in, in fact, I like at West Point they have a hotel that's right on property there. You have to go through the guard gate, and then yes, it's yeah hotel that's owned by some of the former um, uh, 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 West Point grads, alumni. Exactly, alumni. But I, I think mo that they run uh, leadership training programs out of it. Matt Smith, you remember the name right. of the hotel? It's the uh, named after a fa famous um, uh, graduate. But yeah, we're going to do a, our uh, meeting there in August. And we do a lot of, I mean, as you well know, I mean, nobody does leadership training better than West Point. Um, or Annapolis or Air Force, but arguably or the Army. <laughs> ar ar arguably, arguably, <laughs> Army beats out the other two by a a, a great measure. Yeah, but, but the Marines too. But uh, yeah, uh, leadership. Then that's the thing. My well, that's um, that's, that, that's Annapolis. Uh, the right. Marine, yeah. But but the leadership piece. Uh, like I was a commander for nine and a half years in the Army. Uh, I've got a lot of tours in the Middle East. I've done a lot of neat stuff that, I, that, I'm, that I'm really grateful that I'm, that I'm here to tell you about. Um, and I've trained a lot of leaders and, and I've done a lot of uh, 
life coaching and, and leadership training and uh, training junior leaders. And now the parents and the, and the students, they love me because of the leadership and the way that I am. Uh, matter of fact, I've had a parent that really made me feel really great. Uh, that said, Master Spence, we drive past at least eight different studios to come to you. So, and I said, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's an honor for me uh, to really have to teach your child. But I'm still that, that leaky bucket thing. And I need to really get my systems because with the military, you know, it, it, you have to learn the systems because it's the mission and people right. die if you don't follow the systems. Yeah. So I, I got that. But with me, I, I'm, I'm inventing, well, I basically wrote all my own curriculum because I wrote, I wrote doctrine in the army. So that's not new to me. But I, I need just, uh, I need some more. I need your. Uh, well, yeah, well Lynn, Lynn, with your background, there's no reason in the world that you're not earning three or $400,000 a year personally from running a martial arts school. And right. there's the, the reason why I recommend to all business owners to hire veterans is they really understand following systems. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the franchising world and, the franchising world has woken up to, there's an organization called VetFran, et cetera, where they're looking to recruit veterans to run different franchises because, you know, they will follow the system, right? On the other hand, if you don't know what system to develop that already works, you're, you're now back into, uh, you know, going back 40 years into uh, trial and error. And you talk about Master Smith and I background, well, it goes all the way back to the systems that we're using were first implemented by um, um, Fred Astaire Dance Studios and given to Pat Burleson, who gave them to June Ree, Ed Parker, and um, Chuck Norris, who then um, uh, June Ree recruited a Arthur Murray guy, an Art Linkletter guy, and then it evolved through there. So, you know, our... Master Smith and I's standing on the shoulders of giants was standing on June Reed's shoulders and Nick Okinish's shoulders who had systems in place that we never stopped adding and growing and developing. So you can appreciate it's the West Point long gray line, right? And, uh, and Glenn, Glenn said something that was important that, uh, you know, he, he is a martial artist and had been trained and obviously had an instructor who got him to that level that he's at today through his work and a mentor or instructor. And uh, Glenn, that's exactly what you have to do in business, the same thing. You have to become a black belt in business and you can't become a black belt in business by learning out of a box. Uh, you can get ideas, but if you wanna really, like if you want to be a good black belt martial artist, you don't do a home study course you need an instructor or a mentor that's going to train you on a weekly basis over a period of time. Uh, you know, like we even say in our business uh, a training program to get uh, the school owners, they've got to become a black belt in business and it takes four years, no different than getting a black belt in any martial arts to really get the systems down. And we find that in the first six months, the first three months, people will start increasing their gross 10, 20, 40, 50, some of them will double it in that six months or the first year. And then keep going from there because you keep growing, just like in the first year of martial arts training, you might be a green belt or a purple belt, but you know, a year later you're a blue or a red belt and a year later you're a brown belt and then you eventually get to the black belt. And that's done because somebody showed you, watched you, watched you make your mistakes told you they were mistakes, watch you do something you did correct, and then emphasize what you did right. And that's how you get better, the same way you became a good martial artist. So that's why we find that teaching business to martial artists is the easiest thing in the world because they've already learned how to be a black belt and had a mentor and somebody showed them to do the exact same thing. So now it's just repeating that process with a different format. Does that make sense? And especially, Glenn, with somebody of your background. Uh, and amazingly, a lot of martial artists are very disciplined in their athletics and not disciplined in the rest of their career. Uh, you've learned the discipline to apply that to your career. So now we can implement, plug in, impl uh, install systems in your school. 
and and I'll tell you, you know, there's there's no problem in your school that wouldn't be solved by a hundred more students, right? And what we find over the period of time is, you know, this is going to seem weird to say, but our members they solve the problem of of traffic first, and then it's all about keeping them, improving the long-term value, and so forth. And I, I, I think we're losing this connection, but, uh, but he, Glenn, he, 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 yeah, your cell connection is fritzing out here, but, uh, uh, he's still muted too. So that's why. Yeah. But, uh, uh, when locked up, but, uh, Glenn, give uh, Bob a call and we'll schedule a time to talk and get you, uh, get you accelerated. If there's any, uh, one last question, we'll take that. And otherwise we'll call it a day. I hope, it, hope this has been valuable for everybody. Could you give that number again, Master Oliver? Uh, yeah, or Bob can. Bob, why don't you give me your number? 720-256-0200. Okay. Again, it's 720-256-0208. And, uh, and that website's martialartswealth.com. Yep. Any, anybody have a last question before we read off? 720? Uh, yes. 720-256-0208. Uh, Zero two zero eight. And 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 Glenn looks Great. a little bit like uh, Black Panther. It actually, he looked like his nemesis. What was the other? <laughs> <guy>? um, <laughs> the guy that played in the Rocky movie. Michael Jordan. Yeah, yeah, Creed. Yeah, yeah, Creed. Um, Michael Creed. Creed. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, I, I love him. He is great. I love Creed. And he was in something else that was really good too. But, uh, but anyway, Glenn, we'll talk uh, today or tomorrow and follow up. If anybody has a, another question, we'd be happy to uh, address it. Otherwise, we'll uh, uh, ring off for the day. And Blaine, hope your weather uh, gets better. Yeah, and we'll see Blaine tomorrow, right? Yes, oh, yes. on our yes. call tomorrow. On, on our meeting tomorrow at noon. Okay, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining uh, us. Master, uh, Master Oliver, I just one more question. If you, uh, do you have any uh, – are you guys – any more of these seminars? in the east, eastern, like between D.C., Maryland uh, area anytime soon? Uh, the only thing that we have on the schedule is our members event that's coming up in uh, West Point. Okay, uh, and that's in August. And that's in August. Um, we may do some more of those little regional seminars uh, over the year. Master Smith, I think you were going to go to uh, New York City, right, in uh, July. Yeah going to be in new jersey and new york area fairly soon yeah, yeah just oh, give yeah. me a call you just give me a call glenn and you'll get some one-on-one -on -one attention I'll, I'll set you okay. up with master smith and uh they glenn, can really glenn, are you in virginia beach or where are you at virginia beach correct oh, okay, cool. you know our our uh, uh, uh one of our um, success uh, millionaire smarts coach lee miltier uh lives in virginia beach right on the beach and of course uh, you're down the street from uh, jeff and uh uh, Tracy Thomas, who we work with a little bit on websites, is also in Virginia Beach. He's in APA school. But, uh, okay. but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you've talked to Jeff a little bit. You know the credibility of what we do. Jeff uh, uh, found, as have many, that he grew dramatically. Of course, uh, you know, had some um, uh, relationship challenges, but then has come back and is on a dramatic growth spurt again. So, uh, we'd love to uh, to get you there. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, sir.